Okay, um, hello. Uh, my name is Mateusz Kuzak. Uh, I'm a community manager at the Netherlands eScience Center. And uh, at the eScience Center, we work with researchers uh, and we develop uh, research software to help them uh, move forward their research that requires uh, some more expertise in research software development, uh, data handling, efficient data computing. And over the past years, we have developed over the 100 uh, research software packages. We have uh, published over 100 research software packages. Um, but we do realize we actually don't have that many uh, contributions from the outside of the projects and not many users from the outside of the projects. Uh, we collaborate closely with the researchers that we already know uh, that we uh, work in the projects, but uh, there is not much interaction with the outside. And that's something that we would really like to change. And uh, I will be talking about it today. Uh, and this is, uh, my perspective is how can we improve it for research software, but actually the things that I will be talking about, I think can, can apply uh, to other software. Uh, it can also apply to other things, not only research software, but some things in the research culture and how do we perform research and how do we collaborate? So, uh, why open and inclusive? Um, I think, first of all, I think it's the right, right way to do it. Uh, but also being more pragmatic, um, we want to uh, attract more diverse uh, group of contributors. And we also want to have more diverse uh, group of users and uh, uh, people who uh, work with our software. Um, so, um, I've been thinking about how we can improve it, and I've, I've been lucky enough to be involved in uh, a lot of uh, amazing projects in past years. Uh, and I want to give some um, summary or like lessons learned from my interactions in uh, with those projects, communities, initiatives. Uh, what I have learned from what I really appreciate uh, about what they're doing and how that can be applied to improving the to making research software community and software community, collaborative communities, more inclusive, more open, and leading to my more diverse uh, communities. Um, so first of all, uh, we do always, like we start with encouraging uh, open, uh, open software, open source software, uh, but this is definitely not enough. Uh, and I think we're, we're, we're all getting better in developing research software and being, being more open using open platforms and uh, the more projects uh, adhere to standards, they uh, provide very good readme files, they provide contributing guidelines, uh, they also implement code of conduct. Um, there are more and more resources available how to do it, we can learn from each other. Uh, and this is very important. Uh, we, uh, for example, on GitHub, you can now see, you can go to the uh, insights tab and you can learn how your project is doing, uh, does it adhere to standards, community standards, which are there, uh, and how you can improve those things. If you're missing something, uh, you can learn how, how can you add this information, how can you help your contributors interacting with your project. Um, there are also projects like uh, Chaos, which develops the metrics that measure community uh, activity, contributions, uh, contributions and help of your uh, community. And uh, I think like this is really the, the step in the good direction because you need it. Uh, at the same time, I realize uh, in the work I'm doing that this is really not enough. This is uh, the, the passive way. It's there. If people find your project, they will see it. But it does not necessarily mean that if they see a beautiful, very well uh, written readme file uh, in your project, that that's enough to, for them to join the project and feel comfortable and feel invited to join the project. So what can we do better? Uh, I think we can be more proactive in what you're doing and uh, with attracting and interacting uh, with uh, potential contributors. Um, and one, one way of doing it is uh, participating in sprints. Um, and I will have some examples. Uh, I've, not every sprint is uh, equal. <laughs> I have some good examples. Uh, but sprints in general are, are a very good way to pitch your project, to make it uh, more visible, uh, but also to uh, infect others with your passion for your software, for the, for the project that you're working on. Um, 
and also just for the, like starting this human interaction, which I think is it's very important. Uh, we shouldn't be forgetting about it. Um, so good examples are uh, biohackathon European uh, edition. Uh, there's also Japanese edition that I haven't participated in, so I cannot say anything about it. Uh, last year I have uh, participated in uh, bioinformatics open source conference, COFEST, uh, which is, uh, stands for Collaborative Festival, uh, eLife Innovation Sprint, and in the past years uh, I also contrib uh, contributed and co collaborated uh, in the Mozilla Global Sprint. Um, so these are the, the examples of the sprints that uh, allow you to submit your project and then you can find contributors to your project uh, and work with them. Um, there are also other uh, similar uh, events. Uh, I think the nice example is the Turing Way, which is uh, about the Turing Way book, which is uh, the guide to open and reproducible research. Uh, so I have to give the shout out to Malvika, who is in the audience uh, somewhere there. Uh, if you, if you don't know about it, you should check it out. Uh, the Turing Way Book Dash, uh, that's the sprint that I have participated uh, earlier this year, uh, was focused on helping people to contribute to the Turing Way. And even though this was about uh, the product, project itself, the Turing Way project, uh, it really was about uh, helping uh, new contributors bring their own ideas into the project and developing that, the, those ideas and, and then becoming part of the community. Um, and of course, uh, you can organize your own sprint. Um, so uh, before you join the sprint, I think it's very important that you think about uh, what are the different ways that uh, people can contribute to your project? Uh, what are the different skills and expertise that you're looking for? Uh, and being able to describe it and uh, to, to be able to attract the, the, the people who can uh, contribute to the project, but also and uh, you want to be able to uh, accommodate people with different backgrounds and with different expertise. Uh, so you, you want to be able to support them in that. If uh, there might be contributors that not necessarily use GitHub or they don't know Git, how do they, they still are valuable contributors? How are you going to support them? Uh, but also people have different styles of work and you have to think about in advance uh, how to support this how uh, maybe there are people who are not, um, they're, they're not comfortable working in, in large spaces with a lot of people, with a lot of noise. Uh, you can talk to the organizers, maybe there's a silent room that you can, uh, they can work in, or maybe you can bring the headphones and uh, provide the headphones so that they can uh, work in the way that they feel, feel comfortable in. Because uh, they, we all have our different styles uh, of work and uh, that should be supported. Mm. And uh, also, I think it's important that the, uh, the event organizers also think about it and the, the events that I have been participated in, they really emphasize this and they make the project uh, owners think about it in advance, how they're going to accommodate uh, contributors. Mm. The next step when you find the contributors to your project uh, is doing the onboarding process, or onboard them into your project. And I think it's very important not to forget how important it is the, the, the human interaction and uh, the, uh, the best documentation and that the best processes will not uh, replace that. Uh, so think about how you can uh, contribute, how you can on, uh, onboard your contributors uh, because uh, most likely contributing to your project is much more complicated than you think it is. Um, so you can learn with them what are the barriers to contribute to, to your projects, what, what are their experiences, and how you can adapt the processes to make it easier. Um, and one example uh, is uh, from the Carpentries community, uh, the maintenance onboarding uh, project. Um, so, the, the you can uh, so uh, the next step is supporting uh, and uh, helping the community grow and uh, that's uh, you can do it with the uh, inter like increasing the opportunities to interact of interactions co with community and with the project leads um, you can organize community calls um, and through those calls you can meet and get to know your contributors which is very important 
Uh, you can learn about their challenges uh, working with the project. Um, and uh, also you, you will uh, again learn how, about how they work. And uh, I have two examples of that. Uh, one is the Carpenters uh, discussion sessions. Uh, so I have been involved for a few years now in the Carpentries, but actually through the discussion sessions, there are kind of community calls organized by the Carpentries. Back then it was uh, the Software Carpentry uh, organization. Um, through participating in those uh, calls, I have became the part of the community. I learned more about uh, what the community is doing, what are the projects, uh, how I can contribute to them. Uh, and that helped me grow within this community. Um, and then the recent example is the Turing Way Collaboration Cafe. Uh, and I also mentioned it here because this is a great example of learning how people are working and helping people uh, finding their way in the project. So the, the Turing Way, uh, Malvika and uh, Kirsty, uh, who are leading the project, uh, are organizing regular online meetings where you can come in, you can say hello, you can discuss uh, potential contributions, uh, contributions to the project. Uh, you can also collaborate working during, so it can be a working sh uh, working session when you can work either from the uh, from people from the project or with other contributors on something that you would like to contribute. Uh, so I really like that because uh, I've been recently joining those calls a few times when I think about something that I might have, I think that I can have, that I can contribute. Uh, I can join in the call, I can discuss it uh, and see how the, my contributions can fit in and also how we can uh, make it more uh, usable within the project. And then uh, that can be actually extended into the more structured mentoring program. Um, and mentoring is very important to help uh, your community grow, to explore the opportunities within the project. Uh, and uh, mentoring can be organized through, through the uh, community calls, but I think it's also uh, worth uh, considering more structured mentoring with the mentoring teams, with mentors, pairing mentors and mentees. Um, and it also helps the, the participants to adopt the growth mindset. Uh, everyone is learning in those projects. It's the contributors are learning, the experts are learning, the project PIs are uh, uh, are learning there, and it also helps with fighting the imposter syndrome. Um, okay, so how th this is a lot of things, and th this this requires a lot of skills. Um, so, and, and very often the uh, people who develop research software are researchers who have been trained to work in the wet lab, or they have uh, trained to. Uh, analyze data, but they have not necessarily been uh, trained in working with the communities, with building uh, communities, managing them, uh, and interacting with people and, uh, and leading them. Uh, so I, I wanted to give a shout out to two projects uh, that have, uh, are still running. Um, one is Open Life Sciences, uh, and the other one is eLife Innovation Leaders. Uh, and they, they provide mentoring and training of uh, on open science uh, related topics. Uh, and I think what, so I've been participating in this program and uh, my takeaway is that uh, that's equally important, the, the, uh, the expertise that is provided and the learning experience, it's equally important as uh, like gaining the connection with other uh, participants with other mentors, uh, with other mentees, and with mentors. Um, so I think that that's one of the ways to approach uh, this. That's how we can learn. Um, and one last thing uh, we have to remember is a journey. So we have to embrace the growth, growth mindset. We have to keep learning. Uh, we're not necessarily going to get it right uh, from the beginning, uh, but we can improve. And we should keep the conversations because if we want to improve, we have to talk to our contributors or potential contributors and learn uh, about what is their experience. Uh, and also the technology is not everything. It's there for, to help us, uh, but we, it cannot replace the human interactions. Okay, thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. 
Yeah, so thank you for that. I, we do have a, a few questions, and um, just for those that are joining, um, we also have a Slack channel, a Slack workplace that's available, and there is a Slack channel set up for uh, CSV uh, Q&A, and so Matthias will be available there to continue the discussion after this. Yes, um, so I will. If, uh, yeah, so if you, if, if you haven't already signed up for that Slack channel, please go and do that now, and then you'll be able to communicate with all the speakers throughout the event. Um, so yeah, so I think some of the questions that were coming in were really about learning more um, regarding some of the initiatives, because it's like, I mean, one of the great things about the presentation is how you're leveraging other initiatives like the Carpentries or the Turing Institute um, or eLife's uh, sprints, um, and really just trying to figure out more. I think one, one big theme was um, just learning more about sprint-based work, uh, like book sprints or book dash these types of things. Um, I'm familiar with the book sprints model um, and the book sprints organization, but maybe you wanna just uh, explain a little bit more about how people could learn more about that process. Uh, about how to run those uh, or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I don't have a good, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, I think uh, you should talk to people who organize those, uh, those events. So you can talk, to, uh, for example, to Emi Sank, who is also there in the audience and on Slack, uh, who organized the eLife Sprint last year and she organizes the, the Sprint this year. Uh, talk to Malvika, who organized the Book Dash. Um, I think that it's, it's a steep learning curve to organize yourself the Sprint. Uh, but you can start small. You can you can organize. Uh, I mean, the the sprints. Most of the sprints that I mentioned are uh, like multi-project sprints. But you can start with something uh, around your project. That's probably what you will be interested in. Yeah, um, in the first place. So it doesn't have to be big. You can you can organize a small event. You can even start with with like an informal cafe event where we even invite people to come and discuss the project and see how people can contribute. Although no, no, we cannot meet in a cafe uh, for now, but maybe yeah. we can organize online meeting. Yeah, uh, virtual. Yeah, and I think I actually put a link in the chat to the next global sprint, so or the eLife sprint, sorry. Um, and so there is information there for people who are okay. interested. Yeah. yeah, I will post a link to the uh, to there's another presentation here in the chat in a second. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we can continue the conversation over in Slack. Um, and as Nadia said, all of the slides for all of the presentations are being present, are posted up to Zenodo. So we'll be sharing those out as this we put them up. So thank you, Matisse. Thank you, Phil. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the um, first uh, session zero of the CSV uh, V5.